attention. Please have your tickets in hand before you board the plane. Thank you. Hello and welcome. I'm Johan Castell and you're watching Wings. On the show today, Ramadan celebrations worldwide from Kosovo to Saudi Arabia, before exploring what special treats are dished up in Indian cities during the holy month. And how in Belgium, Ramadan and Easter feasters join each other on a two kilometer long table in Antwerp. Also featured is a horse festival in Bulgaria, and a new activity to explore Paris through art ahead of the Olympics. Let's start. Ramadan month is upon us around the Muslim world, and we visited a bustling market in New Delhi for some delectable treats last year. Now we visit a similar spot in Mumbai and look at how Ramadan is celebrated worldwide. The holy month of Ramadan is nearing its conclusion. During this month, Muslims around the world fast from sunrise to sunset. Let's look at what happens worldwide during this special time of the year. We begin in the self-declared independent country of Kosovo. In Prizren, a centuries-old tradition continues during the holy month of Ramadan. Resident Varis Hashim ignites a firework daily to signal the time to break the fast. This ritual, once announced by a canon during the Ottoman Empire, now uses fireworks lit by Hashim, who revived the tradition in 2017. As the sun sets, the firework lights up the sky. Echoing the mosque's call to prayer as the city gathers to break their fast. Although the cannon is no longer used in Kosovo, it's a different story in Dubai. Amidst twinkling lights and crescent-shaped decorations, residents and visitors in the UAE are embracing the full spirit of Ramadan. The iconic Burj Khalifa sets the backdrop as people eagerly gather to witness the traditional cannon firing, which signifies the end of the day's fast and fills the air with excitement. Ramadan, the ninth and holiest month in the Islamic calendar, is marked by fasting, one of the five pillars of Islam. It's a time when religious fervor is reignited across the Muslim world. In Saudi Arabia, residents and tourists delight in the festive atmosphere of Souq al mausim a traditional market established for Ramadan. The market offers a variety of traditional stalls, workshops, crafts, entertainment and food. All set against the backdrop of at Turaif Park, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Organized by the Diria Gate Development Authority, Souq al mausim opened on March 11 and will continue until April 11. Over to Mumbai now to explore what goes on at one of Mumbai's most famous street food spots during Ramadan. So I've come to Muhammad Ali Road in Mumbai to try some delectable treats for Ramadan. And this place is really crowded. So let's take a look around and see what we can find. We begin right in the middle of Muhammad Ali Road at the Minara Masjid, one of the most prominent mosques in Mumbai. At night, the street is covered by twinkling green lights, and even though it looks packed, I'm told this is nothing compared to how crowded it can be. Before we can make a move, I'm invited to try the pirni, a thick and creamy pudding made from ground rice. Wow, that's very good. 
rice pudding, huh? It's supposed to be one of the best places here. This is at the Suleiman Usman Metaiwala, a sweets shop established in 1936, and business is booming as the staff brings in one tray of firni after another. Before I leave, I'm treated to a hearty serving of malpua. So what are we looking at here? What, what dish is this? This is called malpua. Yeah. It's like similar to French toast, but it, it is without bread. We don't use oil in any of our sweets. Wow. We only use ghee. That's our specialty. This must be incredible. Is this one of your favorites? Yeah, my favorite. Ramzan favorite. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to try one of these. Waiting for the Malpua to cook while watching the cook prepare the batter in a huge vat of sixling ghee makes me hungry. I can't wait to try this. One serving of this sweet is enormous and one plate can easily be shared with an entire family. This dish is famous in Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Odisha, West Bengal, Bangladesh and Nepal. Adding a final twist to this sweetened pancake, they add condensed milk and saffron to the top before giving me this huge plate. Wow, look at this thing, it's huge! Wow! It's amazing how crispy it is. It's very hot though. It's like straight out of the sizzling hot ghee. After beginning our food journey in Mumbai with sweets, we move on to find a dish with meat, passing many places where chicken skewers hang on display. We heard about a well-known spot called Bademia restaurant and I meet the owner to learn more about it. By tradition, only in the month of Ramzan, we used to put up this particular soup. Well, this is only for Ramzan that you only have this? Only for Ramzan. No, you won't get it throughout the year. Not even at the Badimya outlet. And what is unique about this particular recipe? Uh, this particular soup is cooked for six to seven hours on slow flame. Basically, it's a lamp uh, bone stock and uh, cooked along with all the green uh, herbs and spices of Indian uh, origin. and. Uh, um, it's a soup that will clear all your congestion and yeah. everything. Yeah. Full of flavor and you get the option of having uh, uh, basically, uh, we call it desi uh, chicken, yeah. palm chicken or uh, the very ancient type of uh, lamb tongue you can have into it. There's a lamb tongue as an There's option, I can try that. You can try that yeah. as a lamb tongue and uh, uh, chicken, palm chicken that you can have as a meat option into it. Well, out of those two, I'm definitely more interested in trying yes. the mutton. That sounds quite yes. unique. Yeah, yes, it yeah yes, let's try that out. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm quite keen to find out what it's like. It'll be my first time trying it, uh, mutton tongue. Yeah. The flavors will start from the tip of your tongue all the way to the back of your head. That's the 80-year-old soup. Oh. oh yeah, now I get it. And this soup is like a combination of like very, very heavy on the spice, but it's also very hot, so it's almost hard to distinguish is it just a really warm soup or really spicy. It just really strikes that balance perfectly. What an amazing experience. The mutton tongue is way less chewy than I anticipated. This meat is quite tender. Going out to have food during Ramadan can be an interesting experience for several reasons. There is the social aspect, it's a time for communal worship and breaking fast together where family and friends gather. Many of the restaurants here on Muhammad Ali Road have special treats on the menu during this time, making for a unique culinary experience. Speaking of a unique experience, I find a place called Hindustan Restaurant and I'm told that they make mutton meatballs here. As soon as I reach, I strike gold. There is a station where a whole crew of chefs sit and crank out fresh mutton meatballs deep fried in ghee. One steak, one bread, yeah, yeah. inside put a small kebab. Oh. Ah, this in, uh, oh, it's in, a secret, in, uh, it's a, in, it's a yeah, secret yeah, recipe. Yeah, yes. All right. Ah, very tasty. All right. Yeah. So it becomes like a little burger. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. Like got that. it. Got it. Got it. I'm given another unique treat, where they take meatballs mixed with eggs, red onion, and chilies, that is then deep fried in ghee. And it's 
egg fried and ghee. Egg fried. Yeah. Mix, mix yeah. kebab. Oh, it's egg and kebab. kebab. Wow. It is now late and I'm full. Before I leave, I find a stall selling dates from Saudi Arabia and try one out, officially ending my culinary journey on Muhammad Ali Road in Mumbai for this time. When I return, I'll do it in the order it's supposed to be had, starting with dates and finishing off with the hearty malpua, which was the highlight of the entire night. Going out to have food during Ramadan can be a way to connect with others, experience different cuisines and immerse oneself in the spirit of the holy month. Last year, we visited an area great for food during Ramadan in India's capital, New Delhi. Let's look back at what we did then. As the sun sets over Jama Masjid, people congregate as the Islamic month of Ramadan is about to end. I find Qureshi's kebab corner bustling with activity. This old kebab restaurant pushes out mutton kebabs by the hundreds daily. Now that Ramadan is ending, it seems much busier than usual. Sometimes the owner, Irshad Qureshi, even allows visitors to try kebab flipping with him. What a hit! He waves me in to give it a go, and it's clear that this is more challenging work than expected. We're cooking up a feast. I find three foreign chefs who have been in India for many years, and this is a place they keep coming back to. So I'm here with Roya, who's trying the food at Kureshi's Kebab Corner. How did you find the food? Oh, I love this food, and day and night I dream about Kureshi. I crave, and just every night I think about Kureshi. I love to eat the kebab up here. I'm served a large platter of kebabs, Romali rotis, red onions, and mint sauce that comes right after. Wow. I quickly finish the massive plate full of grilled mutton meat. During Ramadan, Muslims observe a period of self-discipline wherein they abstain from consuming food and liquids, engaging in sexual activity and immoral actions between sunrise and sunset. As a result, Jama Masjid becomes crowded at sunset, and families gather and break their fast together. In addition, crowds gather for food and shopping in the streets nearby, and the lanes come alive at night. I am so full after having all those kebabs in Qureshi's, but I'm going to try a dessert as well, and I'm going for Shahi Tukta with ice cream, which is quite a legendary thing to have here in Old Delhi. And there's a place for it right here. Shahi Tukra is a popular dessert in the Indian subcontinent that originated during the Mughal era. It is a rich and indulgent dish with bread, milk, sugar and spices and topped with nuts. That is so tasty. I can't imagine what it's like to have this if you've been out all day going around all day without eating anything and you're breaking your fast by having these kind of meals. It's such an experience. The iftar, or breaking of the fast, usually begins with eating three dates. Shops and stalls all over the neighborhood sell dates of different kinds. This man claims he's served this watermelon drink for 20 years, and the demand seems endless. The perfect drink after a long day. So refreshing. With a belly full of food, it's time to head home and let the hustle and bustle of old Delhi carry on without me. Continuing with this season of festive celebrations, next we take you to the city of Antwerp in Belgium, where Ramadan and Easter are celebrated with a big feast on a two kilometer long table. <laughs> The season of holy days and holidays is upon us. While Muslims all over the world observe the various rituals of Ramadan, Christians recently celebrated Easter. However, one district in the Belgian city of Antwerp found a unique way of celebrating these two different religious occasions simultaneously. On Easter evening, thousands of city residents came together on the streets of Borgerhout to enjoy the Muslim Iftar and Christian Easter. 
This is the second edition of this community dinner called Two Kilometers Together at the Table. We try to, to bring people together. It's about fasting, so we try to, um, to start from something that they share to, uh, and to use like the, the different uh, uh, diversity in religion, in culture, to bring people together and uh, to enjoy each other's um, uh, holidays. While some volunteers set the seats for this special feast, others prepared various cultural delicacies and the musicians regaled everyone in the street. They even set a new record by sharing a meal on a two kilometer long table. This was the longest community dinner table in Belgium, hosting 7,000 participants. In a time of tensions and polarization globally, the initiative was held to foster inclusion and connection among cultures. Promoted by the city of Antwerp with various partners, the dinner table has only grown in length since last year and welcomed more people. When you look at the times we live in now, not only in Belgium but all over the world, there are a lot of tensions. So what other better way than this to bring people to the table, eat together and actually start from connecting with what we have in common and not focus so much on how we differ. This intimate community dinner undoubtedly set an example in celebrating diversity with peace. Over to a village in Bulgaria now, in the picturesque Bacevo town, where horse racing and breeding are integral to village life, residents marked the start of Lent with a horse festival. Let's look at the horse parade, which always retains its appeal. Horses thunder down a dusty track in the Bulgarian town of Bacivo during St. Theodore's Day, locally known as Todorov Den. This event occurs on the first Saturday of Lent in the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church. It features competitions to test horses' strength and speed, culminating in the thrilling horse races known as Kushi. The Lyota... The connection is very strong. Years ago when people relied on horses to cultivate the land, when horses were inseparable from people in everyday life, grateful people created this holiday to honor horses. This practice has continued to this day. The scenic village of Bacevo is nestled in the Rila mountain foothills and has a rich tradition of horse breeding. Saint Theodore is revered as the patron saint of horses. Saint Theodore has been celebrated since time immemorial as the patron saint of horses and horse riders by people who used these animals to make a living as well as to fight. The celebration blends Christian and pagan customs, offering owners and buyers a chance to assess the horse's health and strength after winter, often seen with beautifully braided manes adorned with flowers, ribbons and bells. The horse was an integral part of people's existence. On this day we honour the animals and the people who work with them. As the Olympic Games are fast approaching in Paris this year, a new mobile phone game based on exploring iconic street art in Paris has sprung up. Take a look at the story. Come the Olympics in July and visitors will come face to face with these mosaics. A mystery artist who calls himself Invader has cemented his artwork across Paris. It could almost have been a new sport for the Paris Olympics, as it already has avid fans. These mosaics can be found worldwide, even at the International Space Station. More than 350,000 people have downloaded Invader's addictive Flash Invader's mobile phone game that awards points to users who find and photograph his colorful and quirky pieces of pixelated art. Like Banksy, the British street artist Invader also prefers to keep his identity hidden. 
I like the, the adventure of working on a secret project that nobody knows about with somebody that nobody ever, ever sees actually because he stays away from cameras and, uh, and video, as you know. Many of his works look like the aliens from the Space Invaders video game. Some of his artworks come from popular culture, including Spider-Man, Star Wars, Bugs Bunny, Ninja Turtles, Pizza and others. They're always quite attractive. It's really very well done. I like everything related to mosaics. I like the geek culture, the touch of video gaming, a bit old school. That's nice too. And then it's nice because it forces you to look up in the street, to look in places that are perhaps not so attractive and discover that there are still things to see. There are now more than 4,000 of his mosaics in cities and towns across the globe. In Paris, which is by far his most invaded location, the artist's footprint is bigger than ever as the Olympics loom. A new public showing in a multi-story building has one of his works on its roof. Visible via satellite on Google Maps, with a telescope, the show's visitors can also look across Paris to Invader's 1500th mosaic in the city and surrounding areas. I think the invasion is the 15 million people who are going to arrive in Paris for the Olympic Games. It's a lot. Obviously, there will be invader fans among them who will visit the city with the map of the invaders' invasion. You know there is a lot of cultural tourism across the world today with people who discover a city solely with the invaders' map. So what will he do when the Olympics officially begin in July? His fans are certainly hoping for a big surprise. A new games-themed mosaic, perhaps. That's all we have for you on the show this week, but we'll return with another episode next weekend. Until then, it's me, Johan Castell, signing off. Goodbye.